Ringo, Brother Purdy Cone here. All right, good evening. I'm excited about this opportunity to speak to you all tonight. But before I do, um, this past Sunday was Mother's Day, a very special day in our world. Uh, so what I like to do, so I can put this lapel on, is ask for a testimony about your mother. So I'll start, just to kind of show you what it's like. That way you don't take, please don't take like five minutes to describe your mother. Um, so Julie, she's the mother of my children, she's not my mother. Uh, she's my wife, uh, but we have three children, and I just want to say thank God for Julie and all the hard work she does. We have a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 6-year-old, and she has been with them pretty much every day of their lives. She homeschools them uh, every day. She prepares them meals. I can't imagine. If I do this for like half of a day, I'm like, please come home. Um, so I'm just so thankful for Julie being our children's mother. Who else would like it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. God bless. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. Very selfless and sacrificial. Yes, ma'am. That's awesome. Great testimonies, great testimonies. Um, I do have to ask before I start. Michael, did, did someone tell you what I was talking about tonight? No? No one told you. So you're just saying burdens are lifted at Calvary. Just That's amazing. That's amazing. I thought for sure, because I told Dylan. I was like, Dylan must have told him. But that's interesting how it ties into uh, tonight's message. But before I get there, I, I just customary, I need to tell a joke. Um, so... Who was, which character in the Bible was super fit? Absalom. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, you might have thought, I don't know what you were going to say, but maybe you were thinking Samson, this, is, this has nothing to do with this, but it's just like a little free chicken tonight. Um, a lot of times like when Hollywood depicts Samson, like this is this big, like kind of like me, like just this big guy, like strong, busting mis muscles, um, but what I think, what I think, I think 
that Samson was a scrawny dude. I think he was just a tiny, normal-looking guy. Because if he was massive like The Rock or something, and he was going around picking things up, nobody would be like, oh my, how could he do such a thing? But if he was a normal-looking person, like, I don't know, who can I pick on? A you know, Aaron Bibb. You know, if he was just a normal-looking guy, and like, someone saw him pick something up, I'm like, wow, how did he do that? That's amazing. So that's why I think Samson just looked normal. That's just a little free chicken for tonight. So uh, this evening... What is my intention? The intention tonight is, my first intention is I want to be helpful. If you walk out of this room and you say, that sermon was not helpful, I failed. Like, I, I truly want to be helpful. So a couple of months ago, we did a survey in our Sunday school, the couple of Sunday school class, we hand out three by fives, and I said, what are you interested in learning about? And the majority of the three by five cards that got returned said that they wanted to hear, hear about like how to overcome pain and trouble and turmoil and discouragement and um, depression, anxiety, and things of that nature. There's just a repetitive theme. So th that's what kind of led me to what I'm going to be talking about tonight. As you see, the, the theme of our, our, our message is, Are You Heavy Laden? And it comes from the, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but that, my intention is to be, to be helpful. My intention is also to uh, make aware of like, how prevalent this really is. I would guess that at least over 50% of the people inside this room right now are dealing with a burden of some sort. Over 50% of the people in here, there's something on your mind, whether it's, it's work-related, family-related, personal-related, whatever, there's something on your mind. It's very prevalent. Um, I'm a chaplain in the Army, and I have a lot of peers that are chaplains in the Army, and we, we see people, we see soldiers every single day, and they are burdened with different things. There's a lot of burdens. Even for someone who's 19, 20, 21 years old, they have burdens. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but this world is full of burdens and depression. If you'd like to go to the next slide, I have just an interesting little stat here. The NFL, in 2021, the NFL brought in $17.5 billion. In 2022, they brought in $18.5 billion, so therefore I assumed in last year's season, which they haven't really tallied it up yet, they brought in $19.5 billion. Anybody in here NFL fans? Anybody like the NFL? No? Okay. Well, I love the NFL. I love the football. I don't know why. It brings me lots of heavy-heartedness, a lot of burden, because unfortunately, I decided to be a Cowboy fan whatever, for whatever reason, and the last 30 years of my life has just been non-stop depression. Um, but the NFL is a big organization. Like, it goes 18 weeks plus the playoffs, plus the Super Bowl. The, the Super Bowl tickets are ridiculous. Like, the, the amount that people pay to go sit and watch these games is insane. I, I'd rather just sit at home and watch it from the comfort of my own house. Uh, if I had to use the bathroom, I'd just go over there. I don't have to walk down multiple tunnels and worry about what play I'm going to miss. I can, sometimes I can even pause the game. It's pretty amazing. Um, but the NFL brings in a lot of money, $19.5 million. The baseball, Major League Baseball, and the NBA together brought in $19 billion. So that just how, shows you how popular the NFL is, how popular and how much money it bring, brings in. But this next stat that I want to share with you is what really tonight is about. Uh, so I just wanted to illustrate one more time. That's eight zeros, right? $19.5 billion. So it's something I could never even fathom. Um, but this next stat, this is how much the pharmaceutical industry brings in each year, I shouldn't say each year, or last year, so in, in 2022. So $1.5 trillion. $1.5 trillion. That's a huge number. That's a huge number. So when you think about like the most popular sport in America, bringing in $19.5 billion, and then you think about the, the pharmaceutical industry that brings in $1.5 trillion, like just astronomically larger, 11 zeros, three more zeros. Um, and what's even more interesting is the, the pharmaceutical, so that's like big industry, so like big pharma, like all the different elements of revenue, whether it's research and development, et cetera. But the sales part of the pharmaceutical industry brought in $577 billion. $577 billion. That's about 550, that I put it up there, $557 billion more than the NFL. So la last year, you know, just saying, if it was $19.5 billion, um, the pharmaceutical sales part of pharmaceutical industry brought in $557 billion more than the NFL. It's just an astronomical number. And then the antidepressant por portion of that industry brought in $17 billion. So nearly equal to the NFL's revenue was the antidepressant part of the industry. And that tells me that the human race is depressed. 
The human race is depressed. We are a depressed society under the yoke and bondage of sin. We yearn for happiness, or at least being neutral. We just want the pain to stop. So like the behavioral health industry, who here is in the Army? I know we got a few soldiers in here. Uh, the, so who used to be in the Army? All right, all right even more. Okay, excellent. Um, who's related to somebody who's in the Army? Excellent, excellent. Um, there's an organization inside the Army called Behavioral Health, and they are overwhelmed. They are overwhelmed. They've come to the Chaplain Corps, and they said, we need your help. Like, imagine like the hospital, and people are just overwhelming the emergency room with like colds and flu symptoms. Like, the, the, the emergency room's for something that's an emergency, but they're being overwhelmed with all these other, these trivial things. And that's kind of what's going on with behavioral health, is like soldiers are just coming to this behavioral health for trivial things. So they're saying, chaplains, please help us relieve some of the pressure, because there are people that are just going through trials and tribulations every single day. We are depressed people, and they just want the pain to stop. If you've ever been depressed or if you ever had some type of heartache or burden, you just want the pain to stop. And that's why the, pharma the pharmaceutical industry is so popular. It's because you pop this pill and the pain neutralizes. The pain neutralizes. And I, I just want to point out, I promise you, this message is not a smear campaign against the pharmace pharmaceutical industry. I'm not here to talk about big pharma. I'm not against any of that stuff. I'm not here to say if you're in depression, then you're not right with God. I promise you that is not what this is about. Um, I actually take pharmaceuticals myself. I just started recently. Um, I hate flying. I think Pastor Knight was saying something about this the other day, but I also hate flying. I hate it. I hate every time there's turbulence and the, the thing, oh, it just drives me insane. Like, there's been times where, like, I, my hands are sweating, my, you know, sweat on my brow. I'm, like, so nervous. that I've, I've literally contemplated asking the person next to me, can I hold your hand? Because um, I've been so nervous about flying. And, and back when I was younger, like, 18 years old, I flew home for the first time from college, and it was an exciting thing. I've never flown before. Well, I did as a kid, but, like, actual consciousness. Um, and I flew home, and I was so excited about being on this plane. But now that I'm older and more and wiser, you know, I understand, like, these things, there's, they're floating in the air. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and I fly so much with the, the Army, and they make me go over oceans. I just don't like it anymore. So I, I asked the doctor, can you give me something to, to ease my anxiety? And they gave me something, and it really does help. Like, I, we will be, like, over the Atlantic Ocean in turbulence, and I'd be like, wow, that's pretty bumpy. Before, I was like, it's really bumpy. Someone save us. Uh, so I understand. Like, there, there are some medicines out there. Thank God for technology. Uh, there are people inside this room. There are people inside this um, this church that are here with us because of technology and science. So thank God for those things. Now, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't get depressed very often. I don't know if you've really had interactions with me, but I'm not a very depressed person. I'm kind of happy-go-lucky. I like to be around happy-go-lucky people like Buddy. Like, the guy's always smiling and happy. I, th that's the type of person I like to be around. That's the type of person I want to be myself. But I have experienced severe depression in the past, self-diagnosed. And um, it wasn't a fun time. It wasn't a fun time. I lost my ambition. I lost my joy. I lost my desire to be around people. So I can sympathize with people who are going through similar things like that. So if you've experienced worry, anxiety, or depression, I would be the last person to stand up here and quickly say that you're in sin. The circumstances of life can drive us to these things. Uh, I think we should all be careful before throwing out the S word, before we get the whole story. People have lost loved ones, sometimes unexpectedly. People have been abused as both children and adults. It would be easy and almost cliche to think at, at this point to kind of mention, like, just think about someone that was part of the Holocaust. Uh, so just to bring it a little bit closer to home and closer to our time frame, think about somebody that was in 9-11 over in New York. Just think about, like, a little kid um, who got stuck under rubble, and he was sitting there waiting for hours and hours on end, waiting for his parents to come rescue him, and his parents would never come because they passed away in the tragedy. Think about something like that. Are we going to say uh, that this, if this kid grows up to have PTSD that he's, he's in sin? I certainly wouldn't be that person to say that. They are burdened down by the cares of this world, and only the saving grace of Jesus Christ can help with that. Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to be reading verses 28 to 30, and if you don't have your Bible with you, or if you're, it's Wednesday and, and you're just tired, you don't feel like turning pages, I do have it up on the screen for you. Matthew 11:28 28 to 30. Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity, this midweek service that we have. Uh, just come here and fellowship with other saints. I thank you so much for your word that we have to glean over, uh, these promises, these, these things of hope that we can rest in. I uh, thank you so much that you are, you are such a great, loving, compassionate God that you want to help us in the midst of our burdens and to relieve us of, of those yokes. I pray, Lord, that we would lean on you in our dark times. I pray, Lord, uh, through the, the remainder of this sermon, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone in here that's dealing with these things, that this would be a benefit to them, uh, that they would walk out of here encouraged and emboldened in their Christian faith uh, to reach out to you and to get that rest that they need. I pray, Lord, just one more time for Pastor Knight as he's traveling. I pray, Lord, for the, the wedding tomorrow, that everything would go smoothly. And we pray for Pastor Bishop and his family uh, as they're going through this, this dark time in their lives. And I just pray, Lord, that through it, uh, many folks would get saved because of the testimonies that they will be heard. And I just pray, Lord, that you give them safety as they travel back. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus invites us to take off our yoke of burden and give it to him. We, we wear this yoke, and he says, take it off and give it to me, and take my yoke upon you, and I will bring rest to your souls. When we are stressed, burdened, worried, and depressed, isn't that all we need is some rest? You know, if you just think about someone that's carrying all these weights, uh, if I can just take a five-minute break. Who, who here has ever gone ruck marching, whether as a civilian or as a, a soldier before? It's not fun. Um, I just went ruck marching the other day, and I and I couldn't walk properly for like three days after work. It was only eight miles. I don't know how these people are going like 12, 18 miles. It's insane. Um, but, it, you know, you have this thing on your back, and you're like, if I can just, someone can just come alongside me and take this bag off my back just for a couple of minutes, I'll be happy. And Jesus invites us to do that. Jesus offers to take it from us and to give it to him. Today I want to break down some of these terms of depression, anxiety, worry, etc., and then offer some biblical and practical help for our lives. So defining some terms. The first term that we're going to define is cares. So uh, in the Bible, there's, there's numerous ways that we can describe it. What are some ways that we can describe cares that you might see inside the Bible? Some of that's burdened down with cares. Like they're vexed. What are some other ways that you might read in the Bible like, and it tells you that this person's burdened? Vexed, burdened, cares, sorrowful. I know you're not used to this dialogue style, but that's okay. And I know it's Wednesday night, but one more, just one more, and then I'll read my list. Suffering? Cast down? All right, yeah. Um, so anxiety, angst, worry, grief, vexation, sorrowful, troubled. I try to think of every Bible term that I can think of, and that's all I can come up with. But tonight I'm just going to focus on carry, uh, cares, worry, anxiety, and depression. And care is like the big umbrella. So under cares is all these other, these synonyms. It entails all these other terms. It means to be burdened down with emotion, concerned about something or someone. I think we are all each affected by the cares of this world, and I'm concerned about my children. I'm concerned about their life. I'm concerned about my job. I'm concerned about my future. I'm concerned about their future. I'm concerned about my elderly loved ones. I'm concerned about the price of gas. I'm concerned about the Dallas Cowboys. I'm concerned about all these things. These occupy time and space in my head, and these are cares. These are the cares. The next term I want to define is worry and anxiety. I put them both together because they're kind of closely related, but they're a little different. There's a little bit of a nuance between the two. Uh, worry is more temporal, and it, is, it has a trigger. It's, it, that trigger can be identified. So, for instance, I am worried about my job interview. So it's temporal because as soon as that job interview is done, the emotions that are, are associated with my worry will dissipate eventually. Um, so I'm worried about my job. So worry is temporal, and it can be associated with a specific type of trigger. Um, now, I understand it's all semantical, so if I said I, I, I'm anxious about my job interview, everyone would know what I'm talking about. But anxiety is more general and lingering. So somebody who has an anxiety disorder, is not, it's not a temporal thing that just comes and goes. It's, it's, it's something that is with them forever and isn't trigger necessarily related. It's not directly related to something. It could be anything. And... Uh, can come up at any moment without any warning. So to recap, worry is more sp specified and anxiety is more general. Worry is cir circumstantial and anxiety can creep up unexpectedly and without trigger. Now depression, depression is the last term that I want to just quickly define just so we're all on the same page. 
Uh, depression is close to like sadness or sorrow and things of that nature, but once again, just a little bit more nuanced. Sadness and grief are once again event associated. So my my grandfather died, so therefore I'm sad. I'm sad because my grandfather died. I'm I, I'm sorrowful because my grandfather. I'm going through grief because my grandfather died, or my dog died, or my cat died. I would never experience those things. I would be happy. Um, not my, my grandfather. I'd be very sad about that. <laughs> Talking about the cats and the dogs, just to clarify. Um, so because of these things, I experience sadness. Depression is more of an ongoing and lingering sorrow, and it's manifesting in loss of happiness and desire to do things. So somebody who's depressed, like it's, it, you'll notice like it'll change their actual personality. They are changed, and it's a long-term type of thing. Uh, sometimes this happens if they're flooded with multiple sad events at one time or one massive event, and they are struggling to materialize or struggling to emotionally uh, regulate that those events or that event. They lose hope in a better tomorrow. They've lost hope. Someone who's depressed, they're in depression, they've, they have no desire to even go into tomorrow, some of them, some people, because they have no hope in tomorrow. They have no hope in tomorrow. Uh, so just because someone is dealing with care, worry, anxiety, or depression does not mean that they are a bad Christian. I want to read that one more time. Just because I feel like in this time and age, like people are just so quick to judge and throw stones just because someone is dealing with care, worry, anxiety, or depression does not mean that they are a bad Christian. We are all prone to being overwhelmed by the storms of life. And th this popped in my head on the way over here. I can't believe it just popped in my head. Um, but Jesus experienced stress and anxiety in the garden. So much so, he was so consumed with stress and worry that his capillaries burst and started mixing with his sweat in the garden before he was crucified. So if if Jesus succumbed to stress and worry and anxiety, to that point, did he sin? No. The Bible says that he was without sin. So therefore, I can conclude that these things are not sin. But just because they are not sin does not mean that God does not have a solution for us. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But what about us? When we're around people who are dealing with depression, anxiety, stress, what should we do? I'm glad you asked. I'd like to turn over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read the first few verses of this, first five verses. I am very conscious of the time. There's a big clock up there. It says 744. I do not want to be known as the guy that talked too much. Um, I do have a lot of pages here, but I promise to get you out here in a timely manner. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. This is one of my favorite verses. It has very little to do with what's going on tonight, but it's one of my favorite verses. Uh, I, should be, I should be compassionate and empathetic to the point where if somebody falls in sin, my first reaction shouldn't be like, I knew that was going to happen. That bum, I saw that coming a mile away. Like, that should not be my first reaction. It's like, I want to I restore that person. I want to figure out a way to get them back in the fold. I want to get them back in church, get them back into fellowship. Anyways, I'm going to try to stick on topic here. Uh, verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bless you. I saw that burden, and I bore it with you. Bless you. God bless you. Um, but as we're, we're in the midst of people, if, you know, if, if I already picked on a buddy, so, you know, Mr. McVeigh, he's going through something. If I'm going to be Christ-like, if I'm going to fulfill the law of Christ, I should be willing to bear that burden with you. Can I pray with you? Is there anything I can do to help you and your family during this time? That is like the Christian, that should be the Christian community standard. Verse 3, if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. I, what I notice about verse 1 and then the, that next part is that Paul he, he gives an encouragement, but he also just makes us cognizant that we ourselves also can be susceptible. We can be susceptible to falling into sin, and we need to be very cognizant of that. So therefore, we should walk humbly and with meekness around those who have fallen. And then the second thing is, like, people have burdens, so therefore you are also susceptible to burdens. If you have a burden in your life, how do you want other people to handle you? That's how we should handle other people. It's like the golden rule. Treat others as you would have them treat you. Verse number six, let him 
that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches all things. That, that, that really has nothing to do with tonight's sermon, but I really like that verse. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches all good things. So if you have learned this lesson, we're supposed to teach it to other people. We're supposed to communicate that down to other people. My children, um, my children should know what living like a Christ-like Christian should be. All right, so we're, we're Galatians chapter 5. So we see we're supposed to restore those who are fallen, bear the burden of those overwhelmed, have some empathy. In both those commands, we see that we are also susceptible, and Paul says that we will all have a burden. You've heard it so many times. You've heard it so many times. You are either coming out of a storm, you are in a storm, or you're going into a storm. It's one of those three things. I, it's, a, it's a law of the land. If you are not in a storm right now, praise the Lord, but it's probably coming. And you're coming out of a storm, praise the Lord that you got out of that storm. But we're all going to experience burdens in this life. How are we going to, as a Christian, how are we going to handle it ourselves? And how are we going to uh, handle it amongst our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? How can we help in those situations? The next thing I'd like to share with you is the sources of stress. The sources of stress. And no, it's not your spouse, so you can stop poking them. It's not your spouse. Um, although, you know, that, that is a very, the teens aren't in here, but let me just say, like, that's a very important thing. That, this is a lifelong decision you're about to make when you get married. Uh, so pray for the, that young lion kid. Um, <laughs> anyways, I'm going to try to stay on, on point here. Um, so the sources of our, of our worry. So the first source is from without, from without. Uh, there's there's going to be people in this world who don't like you, uh, whether it's your employee, some family member, some, somebody across the pew, or we don't have pews across the chairs. Um, there, there's going to be somebody in your life that might not like you and might mistreat you at some point. Sometimes those stressors come from without. Some people there are going, you know, the police officers, they don't like the way I drive. I, I just love going efficiently to different places, and they don't really like that. Um, but there's going to be some stressors from without. The person I thought of in the Bible um, was David. He experienced stress from without. Uh, there were there was an entire army and a king trying to kill him every day for a long time. And what did he do? Like, if you ever read 150 chapters inside the middle of the Bible, there's this, this book called Psalms. There's a lot of Psalms written by David because he was under stress and he was worried and he had angst because people were trying to kill him. Sometimes stressors come from without. Another source of stressors is, this one's the saddest one, is from within. Self-induced. Self-induced. Uh, this one bothers me. I... I beat myself up a lot because it, either I did something or I didn't do something, and I'm like, why didn't I do that? Or why did I do that? What an idiot. What an idiot. Sometimes the stressors that you're experiencing right now are self-induced, and you need to have that humility and self-awareness to be like, you know what? I put myself in this position. I can't blame God. I can't blame the devil. This is just my own stupidity. Sometimes the stressors of life are self-induced. I remember I was talking to this one soldier, and he was telling me how he couldn't do this one thing. It was financially related. I can't remember what it was um, off the top of my head. But I remember we went into my office, and we broke down his budget. He brought in three months' worth of credit card statements, and we broke down his budget. budget. And there were so many stupid things. Like, he had every subscription known to man, all these gaming subscriptions. He was just buying, like, all these different video games. And, like, and he can't eat. Like, he had no food. He was, like eating ramen noodles, or ramen noodles, however you say it. Um, he had no money. He was complaining to me that he had no money. He wanted gift cards from the, from the chapel. I'm like, well, before we do this, we're going to talk about your budget. And I just saw so many stupid things in his, in his budget and his spending habits. That's self-induced stress. Like, you have financial stress on yourself because you're an idiot. I didn't say that to him, but I said it in my brain. I definitely told Julie when I got home. Um, so the person I think of in the Bible... As far as self-induced and from within is Samson. We talked about him earlier, it's coincidental. Uh, but Samson, uh, he was under so much stress that he says, my soul is vexed unto death. He was so stressed out that he's like, I think I'm going to die from this stress. Why was he stressed and vexed unto death? Because he was in a romantic relationship with a Philistine, and not only that, but she was a harlot. I didn't want to say it too loud because there's kids in here. But you know what I'm saying. That H word. Um, what an idiot, right? Like, of course you're in this, this situation. You made some poor choices. The third source of stress is just, sometimes it's just life. So, so things happen from without. Sometimes things happen from within. But then sometimes life just happens. And this is probably one of the hardest ones to avoid because it's hard to avoid life. Life just happens, right? Some people die. Economies fail. You were born into, into poverty. You were born to narcissists. 
The list could go on and on about things that just happened. I bet we can brainstorm and come up with many other sources of pain, stress, worry, and sorrow, but I want to discuss what we as Christians should do when we experience these things. If you'd like to turn to one last passage, bless you. His was bigger than yours. Philippians chapter 4, it's that dad sneeze. The dad sneeze. Philippians chapter 4 is the last passage I want to talk about. This is like, like Ephesians is to Pastor Knight, Philippians 4 is to me. I, like when, when people come to my office, I go to Philippians 4 more than any other passage. I think this passage right here is so helpful, especially when it comes to depression, anxiety. Philippians 4, I'll just read 4 through 8. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. There's just so much. There's just so much. And I'm going to do this in seven minutes or closer, pretty close. The first biblical prescription that we see from Philippians 4 that Paul recommends is to rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. And it's just, it's just reframing our mind. If we're constantly looking at the black on the white board, all you're going to see is the black. But if we can just focus on all the good, if we can just focus on the good things that God is doing in our lives, it will just reframe our mind. Focusing on the positives, endeavoring to be an optimist, even if everything else around us is falling, we can still rejoice in the Lord and in his salvation. I really wanted to go to Romans. If you, if, if you do take notes, Romans 8, 12 to 18. Romans 8, 12 to 18. Great passage. And basically Paul says, yeah, you might be going through all these burdens and trials and tribulations, but at the end of the day, it's going to be glory. At the end of the day, it, these things are so minuscule. Like if, you, if we were going like to put a, a rope out and like, this is my life compared to eternity. Like, yeah, I might be experiencing some trials, but it's nothing compared to glory. So, at the very least, I can rejoice in my salvation. Hallelujah and praise the Lord for that. Surround yourself with other people who rejoice. Other people who have the joy of the Lord. Proverbs says that a companion of, don't hang out with fools, because a companion of fools is prone to be foolish. Don't hang out, don't be a companion of angry men, because those who hang out with angry men are prone to be angry. So therefore, if I hang out with miserable people, by deduction, I'm prone to be miserable. But if I hang out with people who are joyful, I'm more prone to be joyful. And that's what I want to be. I want to be a joyful person. The, when I talk to soldiers about this, I use this illustration of Tigger and Eeyore. Like, pretty much everyone has seen Pooh before. Um, you know, there's a lot of Tiggers in life, and there's a lot of Eeyores in life. Hang out with the Tiggers. If you're going through depression, you're going to have all this anxiety and you're sad all the time, well, stop hanging out with other people who had the same uh, symptoms. Hang out with somebody like a tigger. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. I love that. Let your moderation be known unto all men. That, that word moderation, it's an interesting word. Another way, a synonym that you could say is like, let your gentleness be known unto all men. Another cool phrase that I, I read recently was, let your sweet reasonableness be known unto all men. Like another way of saying moderate is like a sweet reasonableness. Would anybody ever look at you? Would any, Josiah, would anybody ever look at you and say, man, Josiah, he's got that sweet reasonableness to him. He's got that sweet reasonableness. <laughs> but oftentimes people look at you and like, oh, that, that guy, he's a stick in the mud. Or that lady, she's just nasty. She's mean-spirited. Like, I don't want to be known by that. Paul says, Let, what you should be known by is that you have gentleness, that you have moderation, that you, are, you have that sweet reasonableness to you, that you have that empathy that can help other people who are going through trials and tribulations. Uh, if, someone, if I'm going through a trial and tribulation, um, which name is going to pop in my head? If you're going through a trial and tribulation, will my name pop in your head? I hope so. I hope that I would be somewhere in the list, maybe the top 100, you know, of people like I can call right now. Joe would understand what I'm going through. He would sympathize and empathize with me. I would hope so. But what are you known for? What are you known for? Verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing. Be full of care for nothing. 
be careful for nothing. Be careful of nothing. This is an exhortation, not a command. This is an exhortation, not a command. So therefore, what I'm saying is, if you do end up having some cares in your life, you're, once again, it doesn't mean like you're in sin, because we're all prone to this. Paul's not saying, like, don't ever have concerns, because that's impossible. But what he's saying is, instead of having care, pray, right? That, that's what he's saying. Like, instead of being careful, being full of care of all these things, pray. Paul emphatically is encouraging those in Philippi, and consequently us reading this today, to not fret of things, but rather pray. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be, may new, be known unto God. So prayer, prayer is that sacred space, that communion between you and God. I'm, I'm in prayer. I'm praying to the Lord. I'm having a conversation. Sometimes that conversation is silent. Sometimes I'm just listening and waiting for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Like that still small voice just, you know, sometimes gets super loud. Just, just communing with the Lord. But then that supplication, I love that supplication, um, making a petition to the Lord. I remember this one time, do I have time? I remember this one time, I was in seventh grade, and I did something stupid. Who, any seventh graders in here? I don't know how, I mean, now that I'm so old, everyone looks so young. It's weird. Um, it's hard to gauge people these days. But I was in seventh grade, I did something so stupid. I was in public school, I did so, something so stupid. And my teacher called me forward and she, she said, Joey, I'm going to call your parents. And I'm going to tell them what you did. I was, the fear of God went through, like, through my spine. I was just so scared. And I went home, and I had me a revival. I prayed so hard. I read half the Bible. I, I can't, I was praying, I was sweating. And I, I had, like, two or three hours between, I got home from school, and my parents got home from work, and I was just praying, just praying super hard, reading the Bible. And dinner time, the phone rang, and I'm just, like, on the edge of my seat, like, please don't let it be Every single, I can't tell you how many times the phone rang. The phone never rings in my house. It rang so many times that night, and it was not her, not one time. I was just going through anxiety. And all the way through the weekend, and then Monday came, I came to school, and she called me forward. She said, Joey, I decided not to call your parents, but don't you do, I was like, man, I got right with God. It's never going to happen again. I promise you. But I was supplicating. I was making petition to God, please, God, don't let me die by the hands of my parents. Please. I am too young to die. But take it to the Lord in prayer with thanksgiving, once again, renewing our mind to focus on the positives. The difference between Christianity and psychology is that we don't just say, I'm thankful for this. We say, I'm thankful to God for this. God understands how our minds work. And he gives us that peace that passes all understanding. This is my favorite part, the peace that passes all understanding. I love witnessing in other people's lives when they fully put their trust in and rest in Christ, and Christ relieves them of that burden. Getting to see that, the pains of this world relieved, it, it's just such a beautiful thing to see. Because when bad things happen, like think of something just tragedy, like some type of tragedy that goes on in someone's life, and I've seen where somebody from the world, somebody who's unsaved, a tragedy happens, and a very similar tragedy happens to somebody that was inside my church, and just seeing the two different experiences, there's a, a void, there's this massive chasm inside their lives, and this person has no idea what to fill it with. They're filling it with with drugs, they're filling it with alcohol, they're filling it with uh, all sorts of debauchery. They're trying to fill that void and they just can't. And then we have this Christian over here who fills that chasm with the Lord and lets the Lord take that burden from them. And just seeing that peace, like how, how does that happen? Like how, how can you be going through this trial, tribulation and, being, and having so much peace? It's the peace that passes understanding. It's a beautiful thing to behold. One of the many benefits that we have as Christians with God, the Prince, of peace. I love how this passage says that he will keep, it says in verse 7, that he shall keep your hearts and minds. Aaron Bibb, when in the book of Proverbs, when it says, keep your heart with all diligence, what does keep mean? Protect it, to guard it. I love that. I love that. Using, just using the Bible kind of to find itself, that he shall keep your minds, your hearts and minds. He is going to guard it. He's going to protect it. Like the kids in here, like pretend like he just put, like, inches and inches of bubble wrap on your heart. He's protecting your, when we can just give it to the Lord, he will protect our, our mind. He will guard our mind and our hearts. And that's what we need. That Our mind is so fragile. Our heart is so fragile. It can bring so much pain and agony in our lives. But the Lord wants to relieve us of that pain and agony. God is standing guard protecting your hearts. Prevent, oh man, preventative medicine. 
In my ministry with soldiers, I try to focus more on preventative methods rather than reactive methods. I do a lot of single soldier retreats. I do a lot, a lot of marriage res- retreats because I, I would rather spend all my time telling them, hey, like, let's avoid these traps over here. Let's avoid these financial traps. Let's avoid these dating traps. Let's fo- avoid these marriage traps. Uh, and talking to the married folks, like, this, this is the best way to do it. This is what the Bible says, how marriage should be. And I try to do all these things to try to be preventative so that we're not reactive and we're just having tons of, of terrible situations in our unit. I want to be preventative. And verse 8 is that preventative. Verse 8 says, Brethren, what sort of things are true? And there's a whole list. And he says, If there be any virtue, there be any praise, think on these things. That's preventative. Instead of focusing on all the, the nonsense of this world and all the negativity, negativity and all the worldliness and the fleshliness that's going on inside this world, think on godly things. Think on godly things. And that will help, that will help de- declutter so much nonsense inside of your brains if we would just focus on godly things. We can honestly spend months examining different people in the Bible and what they experience, but Philippians 4 is a great place to start. If we can just train ourselves to take things to God in prayer and learn to rest in Him, our lives would experience so much more joy and peace. Lastly, just some practical advice. Some practical advice. Uh, some of these, these pieces of advice um, do come from the Bible, but sometimes I share them with even ungodly people, unsaved people. Um, the first one is I love this proverb. It says, a cheerful heart doeth good like a medicine. A cheerful heart doeth good like a medicine. Sometimes if you're going through a depression, if you're in here and you're, you're depressed, some things besides praying and, and reading the Bible and going to God and trying to give God these things, another thing I'll do is I'll watch a comedy. There's some comedies that, like, it's, it's a sure thing. I watch this comedy. I could have been in a bad mood. Now I'm in a good mood. A cheerful heart doeth good like a medicine. It's therapeutic. It's psychologically therapeutic for my heart when I laugh and I have a good time or it, put yourself around people that make you laugh and and are, are happy people. Another one is First Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. There's two cares in there. There's the cares of your burdens, and there's care of his compassion and love. I love that verse. Cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. God, cast your care upon God. Only concern yourself with things that you can control. If there's things that are outside your control, just forget about it. Just forget about it. If you can't control it, don't worry about it. Learn to regulate your emotions. Um, don't allow things to build up. So if you, who, who here does dishes? Anybody do dishes? I do dishes probably like once a month. Thank God for that. Um, but if, you know, back in my bachelor days, I, I, I would have a sink and I would have like, you know, one or two meals worth of dishes and, and I'll, be, I'll get it later. And then that two, two meals turns into three meals and four meals. And five. Then suddenly I have a whole week of meals, dishes inside of my sink. And I don't want anything to do with it. It's overwhelming. It is burdening me to the point where I'm like, let's just throw it away and start new. Let's go buy some new ones. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're taking these burdens and you're just stuffing them, I'll take care of this later. I'll just take care of this later. I'll just take care of this later. I'll give this to God later. And you're just, suddenly you find yourself carrying all these burdens. It's going to overwhelm you. It's going to overwhelm the system. Learn to regulate your emotions and don't allow things to build up. The importance of good parenting. I can't tell you how many I, I can't tell you how many soldiers that come to my office, and I, and when they leave, like I, I almost shed a tear because I'm just so sad and burdened for them because of how terrible their parents were when they were growing up. Now I know there's always three sides to a story. There's always three sides to a story, but even if it's thirty percent true, it's sad. Like man, wow, it's terrible. We can, the adults that are in here, there are things that we're dealing with because of our childhood. And as parents, we, we should endeavor to protect our children, not only physically, not only spiritually, but also emotionally. The, the trials and tribulations that some adults have to deal with at, now is because of what took place in their childhood. Try to protect your children. And then the last, the last thing, please say it's the last thing. Uh, yes, the four pegs, and this is my conclusion, I promise you, I promise you. I got the four pegs, and then I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to walk away from the Bible, and I'm going to walk away from my notes. All right, we got the four pegs of stability. So when I think about people in my life, my life, um, who show resiliency and stability through trials and tribulations, like there are things going inside of their life, and they're unshakable, like a chair, right? They're, they're unshakable. Like, they can be an earthquake, they, they don't fall. They have these things in common. They have faith, family, friends, and future. These four, these four pillars of stability. Faith, um, at some point, they, they have some type of uh, principle or value system that they live by and that gives them meaning and purpose. Now, we as Christians, our, our, our faith comes from the Lord in the Bible, we're Christians, so 
uh, that's where our that's where our faith our principles, our value principles come from, is from the Bible, and we live out those things, and it gives us purpose and meaning and also like direction. But then family, people that have resiliency, they have a strong family, a family that loved them. They grew up in a family that had uh, a s- strong structure where they loved their children. They grew up in happiness. Uh, didn't necessarily have to be riches, but they had riches and happiness like we were hearing back here. Um, there's a different type of riches, right? Uh, so they had family. They have some type of structure of family. They had friends. Uh, they had people, a, a, con- a communi- um, community, that's what I want, a community and a fellowship with other people. So it wasn't just their family. They didn't, like if, if the only friends you have is your brother and sister, um, you know, I, I feel bad for you. You know, you should have some type of friend network that you can rely on during t- tough times. I'm, people that have stability and resiliency, they have a, com- a, communi- a community and a fellowship outside of just their family. And then the last thing, a future they, they are looking forward to things. They, they have plans. They are endeavoring in a direction. They, there's, there's something at the end of their tunnel that they're looking for, that they're driving towards. People that are, that are unstable, that are dealing, have a hard time with resiliency, they don't really have like plans. Like, what's your, your five-year plan? I don't really have one. Um, so the people that have stability, they have these, these four elements. And then uh, the fifth one, if you can see that there's kind of smaller, but it's finances. They, they say, money cannot buy happiness, but I promise you it surely doesn't hurt, right? Um, if you want to try it out on me, I'll let you know how the, the results go. Uh, anyways, but you know, finances is also another aspect. You know, just thinking through your budget and just being responsible with your money so that you can take care of your, your family. Um, I believe that's the last slide. So in conclusion, in conclu- I'm going to go back to my notes because I don't want to mess anything. But in conclusion, people are going through trials and tribulations. And you might be here saying, this is me. I'm dealing with trials and tribulations. And they're insurmountable. And it's bringing me a lot of stress. I'm sorry. I wish I could just get up here, wave the Bible, wave my hand, click my shoes three times and say prosperity and everything will go away. But that's just not reality. The best advice I can give you in a generic sense is to trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There's times where I'm going through trials and tribulations, and I want to, the first, my, my first reaction is I want to use my logic, I want to use my education to kind of problem solve. But that shouldn't be my first reaction. My first response should be going to the Lord. I need to trust in the Lord more than I trust in myself. We need to go to God. Go to God in prayer. We all need to rest in the Lord more. Instead of going through life, struggling with all these burdens, saying, I can do this, I can handle this. I can handle this. And just day in, day in out, I can handle this. I can handle this. Just give it to the Lord. Just cast it at the throne room of God and say, God, I, I'm trusting this promise. I'm going to cast all my care upon you because you care for me. And I'm resting that you will give me that peace that passes all understanding. That is my hope and my prayer for you tonight. Once again, I don't know all the things that are going on, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there's something going on in someone's life inside this room. And I hope this was a blessing to you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I pray in spite of my longevity uh, that some truths still permeated our tired minds and hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, that, I pray, Lord, that these truths would be helpful and beneficial to all of us that are inside here because we all deal with these things. And I pray, Lord, that we would rest in that promise that you want to help us through the trials and tribulations of our life. I pray, Lord, before, that we, before we run to anything else, that we would run to you, that we would run to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring to mind some things that we've, we've kind of tucked in our, in our bag and said we're going to take care of it later, that you would bring these things to mind, that we would uh, be able to take care of those things soon, and that we'd bring them to you, and that you can help us with that healing process. And lastly, Lord, I, these things that we talked about tonight, these are blessings that we get from you because we are your children. We have accepted you as our Lord and our Savior. We've been adopted by you. Uh, we, can, we can cry out, like Romans 8 says, that we can cry out, Abba, Father, because you are our Father. And I am thankful for that privilege, privilege. but I, I don't want to take for granted that everyone in here has tasted of that privilege. I pray that there's anyone in here tonight that does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they, they have trials and tribulations that they need help with. They need you. I pray that you would prick their heart and let them know they need to trust you as their Lord and Savior. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to stand, we'll just have a few moments of prayer to deal with God for a few moments.